we had to line up on the first time we went into into action, and uh, we were um, um, reinforcement battalion for the second first battalion. Second first battalion went into Bardia first day, and we went in cleaning up what they'd left, and that was our first lot of action going yeah. into ba into Bardia. Yeah. And then the next put took we took on the, and then was to Brook. Yeah. And uh, we were the lead battalion going into the Brook. Yeah. And uh, we lost a few blokes there too, but mm. we got into the Brook okay. And then we uh, went on then <coughs> into uh, into Benghazi. Mm -hmm. Now Benghazi capitulated, mm -hmm. and we one of our platoons marched in with steel helmets and and. Uh, and bayonets on their rifles and one thing or another in case the capitulation message that he was reading, reading out, the Mukta or whatever he was for the village of Benghazi, he's reading it out and then the, another chap there, the interpreter read it out in English and then Doherty signed it then as uh, for the Australian Army. Well that was okay and we were uh, Settled in outside. No, we went into the army barracks there at Benghazi. It was the Italian army barracks. And after cleaning the the uh, room or bedroom type of thing uh, that we had, we cleaned it out and got the bugs out of it and what have you. And we were using that. <coughs> of course, the Italian knew we were in the barracks. And the the next thing, the the barracks were bombed. And so, <laughs> and old Doc said, this is no bloody place for us, so we went out along the, the uh, Tripoli Road yeah. out of Benghazi, and along the tri Tripoli Road, and uh, we were waiting there for a while, and then the next thing we know, uh, we got an order then to go back and into Syria, see, so that's how we come back, how we got back there. Yeah. But we went, went right through from... We went up into Syria then and were on uh, garrison duty there. You went from boiling hot, dry, desert conditions to uh, freezing cold. <laughs> we were up, uh, up in the Albanian Alps. Yeah. In the uh, Verbi Pass. Yeah, the and extremes. When I say cold, you, you, I, I mean cold. You, you found out we only had one blanket per person, yeah, but we had yeah. our greatcoats. Yeah. But we found out that. Two people under two blankets was a lot but, better but, than mm, one under one blanket. Yeah, and, you, and your, your uniforms were pretty tidy by then, weren't they? Oh, well, we uh, we had uh, great coats. Yeah. yeah. They were a good thing too. Oh, yeah. fabulous. Yeah. yeah. The old great coat is <laughs> well worthwhile. Too hot for you, isn't it? <laughs> that was great. We had to sleep out at night. Yeah. I'll tell you what. It was the best thing ever. It was the best thing ever too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got but we got back to this drone defence, a drone, like, and, and we did, but we had, we had to get across the Ali Ackman River, mm -hmm. and the eye sergeant and I, the chap the name of John Feller, uh, the doc said, go and see if you can find a place where we can put a human chain across the river and get yeah. the rest of the battalion out. Yeah. We lost one full company. He, he uh, and a chap by the name of Barham, and uh, he was Major, Major Barham, and uh, he lost quite a few with the, uh, with the uh, Germans, they were cut right off. Yeah. <coughs> so he decided to, to be, let the, his company go prisoner of war. Mm. So that's what happened to him, but I'll tell you a little story about him in a little time too. And, uh, <coughs> At any rate, uh, after we couldn't find a place across the river, mm. I swam across, yeah. bundled up my gear, my uniform, and and uh, put me put my ground sheet down and tied it for flotation in the river and, and floated across the river. I go down to uh, to uh, brigade headquarters to see if they couldn't put a get some barges put across so we can get the, 
the uh, other three companies of the battalion across the river. And uh, at any rate, there's a Pommy engineer uh, on brigade headquarters there, and our brigade uh, officer was a chap by the name of uh, Shepherd. Jeep Shepherd, we called him, at any rate. They said they, they can't, haven't got enough barges, but they got enough equipment to put a, a single line bridge across. Well, that did. Well, I said, beggars, beggars can't be choosers. I said, yes, we'll have the swim, the swim, uh, the, the single line bridge across. Yeah. But he said, it'll take us about eight days to do it. So you'll have to hold the Germans off for eight days. So I get back, swam the river again, got back and told Doctor, we're getting a. Uh, a, a single line bridge put across. I hope it's okay. He said, beggars can't be choosers. He said, that's all right. And so uh, I then, uh, we did full patrols were on and everything and making sure that I think we did more fighting then. Uh, so you married Mar Marjorie one month before you left? Yeah, Marjorie Eva Yates. Yes, and and um, and you had two sons, so when were both of those... No, that is not quite right. It's not quite right? No. No, because um, one of them she adopted as a baby. Yeah. And the other one was her sister's son. So both those sons are now gone. I, yes, I read that. Now, I? one of them was a champion dirt track rider. Yeah. And he had a bit of a crash down in Oran Park. Oh. And, uh, they wouldn't let him race again until he got uh, checked out the hospital. So he goes to the police, took him to Nepal in the hospital uh, to give him a check out. And he was standing up talking to the police as I'm talking to you today. And he, he just dropped it, a clot of blood went to the brain. Uh, and that finished him off. Okay, so not that old. And the other fella, uh, he got smashed up with, um, between Curry and, uh, and Maitland uh, uh, in a car crash. And oh. that finished him off. An awful lot of grief. Anyway, uh, I'm still going. You are still going. And uh, as I say, they suddenly found out I've been 50 years of JP. Yeah. So they got a special show on on the 22nd of the month down at Parliament House. Yeah. I, I'm not frightened of uh, death in any way whatsoever. I did a yoga course. See, part of my uh, film I did about seven years, I think, as a stage hypnotist. Once you left, once you left the army, you then became a, a, you set up a business with Lewis, the fellow that you yes, were. Yes, that's what Warner's Bay. At Warner's Bay. And then I bought him out, and I was the local storekeeper there then. Yeah. And that's when I got the JP with Don Giddies. After not a not a show for a while, the thought transference. It put me in touch with a professor, William Sargent, who was a professor of psychology at Edinburgh University. And uh, I wrote articles for the British Journal of Medical Hypnosis, uh, uh, highlighting thought transference. See, on the stage show with a hypnotist, one of my opening shows was uh, to get the local member up to write something on the blackboard one end of the, the stage, and she's down the other end of the stage facing in the other direction, and she'd write on what I transmitted to her to do. So that was okay. Anyway, after about five years, I had a whole or more, I'm not sure of the amount of time, all around the Riverina area, from Wagga, Coolamon, Gown, Main, um, all, all, all around the end, and uh, that was okay. And there was something in the paper that you could pay for a Volkswagen Combi van here in Australia and pick it up at Biedenburg in Germany. And she said, that'll be a good idea, what do you think about that? So, soon we were getting a bit tired because Thought transference, you don't think takes anything out of it, but you're doing it mentally, and uh, it does tie you out a bit. I used to come out. So, so it re you really do. Well, it, it's a genuine thought. I'm it, not. Wow. No, hip, hips and that, and if I say no something. No tricks. Else, it's no, nothing at all, and that's what they did. And any rate, this chap uh, at Murray University, I give him, him a demonstration there, and he's like all oh, professors. They check on things, and they, he said. All your thought transference is done in the English language. I said, yes, that's my, my language. And he said, how would you go trying to transmit thought to people that didn't know your language and you didn't know theirs? 
And I said, well, I think I can do uh, image control, do yeah. it, make the image do something. He said, would you like to try it out? So they gave me an introduction for the um, university at Kiev, or Kiev, whatever you like to call it. And him and Kiev used to do interchange visits. One would come across and do a couple of months at Kiev, and he'd do a couple of months at Edinburgh. And at any rate, I give the demonstration there, and that went off all right. But in the meantime, he put me in touch with uh, uh, a Raja in uh, in um, New Delhi, in Old Delhi, yeah. Old Delhi in India. See, yeah. and then anyway, you part of our wanderings, I travelled all over Europe in the combi van, all the good good times, and then I went back and. To London, and in uh, London, I got myself a job there through the winter. So, so what, when was this in your period in your life? When were you doing all of this? That was uh, no, well, I left the army uh, forty-six. In nineteen forty-six, yeah. and so, and Marjorie was travelling with you. Is that right? She come up to Canungra after I, oh, from the army. Uh, I was in the. Uh, Militia forces yeah. before the war in the 56th Battalion of Wagga. Yeah. And I've already become a sergeant. But I'd already done an AIC, Army Instructional Corps course, yeah. and uh, at uh, Renwick Small Arms School. And I was waiting for a posting then when w war broke out. And I went and showed my credentials to this chap by the name, uh, Master, Master Yoga, by the name of Rama Shiraka. Yeah. Now he's written several books, and the, when I made myself known to him, he said, seeing you're on thought transference and that sort of thing, he said, how would you like to do a yoga course? He said, I've got three or four vacancies in Raja Yoga, R-A-J-A. -A. Raja Yoga is the yoga of the subconscious mind. You know, you've got a subconscious mind, yeah. don't you? So what? tell me, what, what, what year was this, or what years was you doing? Oh, uh, 68. Oh no, 60. So, how did you get into the thought transference and the... Well, I found that come from an early age. Oh. I could, we used to sit on the back veranda, and I, I could get one brother of mine, he's still alive, he's 90, 96, <laughs> 97 now, in, right in, the in, uh, in Wagga, at uh, Cumley Gardens retirement home. Yeah. At any rate, uh, I could make Ron, just by thinking, go on out and get me a glass of cold water and things like that. And Mum Jerry, what I was doing, yeah. and she, she was a very smart lady. She used to have a midwife for Earth Open and Maternity Clinic. And she gave me a book, book then, and it was written by a lady by the name of Emily Pauley. Now, she wrote the book about mesmer. After you dissect your subconscious mind, you learn how to leave part of it down to look after your body elements and the rest of it you take it around and take yourself up onto the astral plane. Well him and I used to go up on the astral plane together, you might, might think I'm half silly today. Who, <laughs> who used to go on the astral plane with you? Rama Shiraka. Oh yes, right, the, the yoga right, instructor. Master yoga. Yep. Yep. And uh, we'd play around on that and then but you put yourself into a cataleptic state to get yourself in the mind that your body can be looked after while you're away. You know what a cataleptic state is? No. <laughs> well, it's a state of stiffness. Your whole body becomes stiff. We used to use it on, on hypnotic shows. We'd uh, oh. put the place in a, in a stiff state and put their head on one chair and their feet on the other and sit three or four fellas on. Well, you couldn't, with your own conscious or analytical mind, with your analytical mind, you haven't got enough power in that to do it. But with your subconscious mind, you can do it. So that's what I used to do then. But I trained myself to put myself into that cataleptic state. So when I get in the car, well, then the wife used to panic every now and then, and uh, she, uh, she'd call an ambulance and that one. <laughs> she couldn't drink me out because I wasn't ready to come out. So I right. could, couldn't come out like come down from the astral plane. Oh, look. This this gets more complicated. So what happens on the astral plane? <laughs> well, when you go to the astral plane, what happens there? Well, you just float around in amongst other bodies. You float around. It's like, I don't know how to explain it. It's just like a lot of people getting around with a, 
a white sheet over themselves type of thing. That was my interpretation of it. And uh, you just float around and I met with this bloke up there and we used to have a yard ring and all that. But you're getting onto the deep stuff now and the, on the uh, mesmerism and all that sort of thing. Now that's how mesmerism started. Yeah. This doctor, in, he was Dr. Mesmer in Paris and uh, when the Greeks got onto it, because they were the learned people in those days, and when they uh, started using mesmerism then, they, they went over and seen what he was doing. Of course, they adopted it too. And then uh, they changed it over from mesmerism to hypnotism. Right. Hippo in Greece is sleep. Yeah. So it's a sleep in Greek is hippo. Right. Hypnotism. And we get overrun in northern Greece when, yeah. when the Germans come into yeah. us and then started fighting an enemy at your front. Yeah. One was in behind us, of course the battalion on our right got broken through yeah. and they come through with their light tanks and their motorised infantry and uh, instead of fighting people in front of you, fighting people that were in behind you. Yeah. And we went along the end of the... We went through Kazani crossroads there. It's, it's uh, Exxon there and crossroad or Kazani, whichever you like there. And that's the name of the township there. And, uh, we made, made a a, um, a bolus uh, stand on the northern bank of the Aliakman River. No sooner got to step in there and taking out uh, patrols and everything and looking out, and I also cleaned the village out there, little village. It's uh, uh, Mick Pavelton. At any rate, uh, the Germans had taken over that village. They were raping the women and killing the blokes all from one thing or another. So I went and took a Bren Gunner, chap of name of Charlie Jewell with me, Bren Gunner, and I took him in and uh, with a troop and we cleaned the Germans out of it. Did and, you? and that is down, don't take that for, for, for gospel, but that's down in Greek military history now. Yeah. How do you feel about the enemy? Like, you encountered, obviously, the, the Germans and the Japanese on different occasions. I uh, had an interview with a, a German officer. He, with the one arm, I had an interview with him in front of that TV, in the uh, Greek TV, and uh, he said the same as me. Yeah. He said, I did what our government asked us to do, yeah. and I said, I did what my government, government asked, asked me to do. do. So, you so that was all. I had no trouble with him, shook hands with him, yeah. Bought him a beer or something, and yeah. and everything was under control. But he lost when you saw your 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 fellow colleagues fall around you. What was it like? Well, we were trained to do that sort of thing, I suppose, and uh, no doubt it it had an effect on you. Now I can mention something else I got today, and I don't know how I got it. I've got a German Iron Cross at home. Oh. That's equivalent <laughs> to our to our Victoria Cross. Yeah. Now. For the life of me, I don't know how I got that Iron Cross, yeah. but I've got it all right. It's, See, when we were burying them, yeah. if we had time to do it, uh, I'd go through their pockets. Yeah. And I'm most likely, in the heat of the moment... Grab one. I yeah. grabbed <laughs> No, I went through their pockets and yeah. before I buried them and, and yeah. uh, shoved it in my pocket. Yeah. And that's the only way I can bring to mind oh, how I've got that Iron Cross. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's in the Russian front, it's given on the Russian front. Now, it uh, tells me that, that, that it was given to a, a Spanish officer. Now, Spain took on the side of Germany yeah. when they fought the Russians. Yeah. The president of the sub branch, president of the club limited, and Hamilton Club, and uh, all this sort of thing. And I'm also national president of the 2nd 4th Battalion Association. <laughs> and I've been running that for several years out of uh, Gallipoli Memorial Club in Sydney, of which I'm a life member of too, but <laughs> don't know all this about me. And uh, I'm a life member of the Pancretan Association, I'm a life member of the Greece and Crete committees, and all this sort of thing. So I'm, uh, if I go tomorrow, I've had a fair run. Do you still swim, I believe? Yeah, I, I started, I was an original member of the Royal Mary with a rack mackerels with a yep. swimming club. Yep. But prior to that, I uh, did about 10 years as patrol captain for Mary with a surf club. Yeah. Now, how that came about, they, they were short for, for enough patrols to fill their 
uh, council commitments at Merriweather. So I took over uh, eight or ten chaps from the Merriweather Mackles, and those that didn't have their bronze medallion, I put them through that and got their bronze medallion, and that's how I got the, And then after a couple of patrols, I was patrol captain, and I did patrol captain then for about ten years. And uh, also then I was, I was also appointed zone supervisor. Uh, I took in from uh, from um, Swansea, Belmont, uh, Newcastle, Nobbies, and over to Stockton and, and, and uh, Newcastle and Stockton Surf Club. So I was zone supervisor for those too. Anyway. So w when you were travelling as a hypnotist, what happened to the shop? Oh, that, that was after I, I gave that away. You gave the shop away, I did a, yeah. did a course in industrial psychology at, Ed, at uh, Sydney Uni. What attracted you to that? Just your natural talent in the first place? Yes, well, I just thought, you know, I've, I, I've got to learn more into this, but that's how I got into that. Yeah. And uh, today, and even so, I can make that brother of mine do things. And <laughs> mum used to say, leave poor Ron, Ron alone. I said, I've never said a word to him. <laughs> no, but you're making him do it. <laughs> but this is how, how I got onto that thought transfer. You yeah. asked me that question yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. Could you do it with other people as well? or just? Oh, brother? no, I could do, do it with most people. Can you still do it? Yes, I can. It, but you said it, it's, it takes a bit of effort. Well, it's a mental transmission. Yeah. But you, uh, you do that, but to get into the astral plane, and that's a different setup again. Yeah. But it still works on your subconscious mind. Yeah. Most women have three, three, sub, three, three minds, you know. They got the subconscious mind, they got the analytical mind, the uh, conscious mind, and they got the ladies' mind. The ladies' mind. <laughs> Didn't you know that? <laughs> so we've only got two, have we? We've only got two, I haven't to know that. I've only got two. But I'm a bit worried about me on occasion, I'm telling you. I was going to ask, when, when you're on the astral plane, are you still in control? Can you bring yourself... You can, by thought. It's, it's all done. It's, yeah. it's part of your mind is up there, your subconscious mind. Now, you wake up sometimes after a long dream, and you can remember the whole of your dream. Other times you've dreamt of other things and you don't seem to remember it. Well, that's when you, you take over from your, uh, from your uh, astral body or your subconscious mind. But it's a complicated setup. Do you think having that has assisted you in your longevity? Oh, well... Or is it just good genetics and good living or...? Well, swimming did a lot to it. Yeah. Uh, so the hypnotist show then was um, in Australia. That's where you taught yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that was right. a, that was a, that's around the Riverina area. Yeah. Like, okay. hey, uh, Wagga. I had, I worked at Hathwaite's in Wagga, see, for ten years until I got to uh, twenty one, and they had to pay me full wages. So they, I said they can't afford another senior in the hardware department. So I, I got the bullet for that, but uh, that was okay. But that's when I did uh, industrial psychology at Sydney Uni. And that's how all this came about. Uh. Oh, as I say, but you want to know how I come to doing hypnosis? Well, I got that from uh, um, Franklin, Frank Quinn. They, they, he was going around the, the hypnotic circuit too. Right. And uh, one of his uh, stagehands had a row with him uh -huh. about something or another. And his name was Jeff Broadbent. And after I, I did a few thought transference, I put a, the school at Metcalf Street, Warner's Bay, a senior's class, and uh, I put them under hypnosis on there and knew the teacher there. And uh, I said, do you want to try an experiment, see? And I put the whole class under hypnosis and uh, Wish made I could them do willing that. to learn <laughs> and to try and do top of the class and all this sort of thing, see? And he was amazed, but the parents got in, in touch with it and uh, 
they got to the education department and said they, they didn't want me hypnotising skilled classes again. <coughs> and uh, this is where it come in. They were sending the kids to learn at school, not to go to sleep. <laughs> and, and so that stopped me giving demonstrations in schools to make the, the kids more attentive with their own subconscious minds to, uh, to do their lessons. And he you said they're the best class he ever had. Lessons. Did yeah. you, you? So my understanding of hypnosis is that you put them under hypnosis, hypnosis and then you bring them out of it. Now I wrote so did you leave them under there for the whole... My program? definition of hypnosis is the control of the activated subconscious mind. Yeah. Uh, you know, you act the subconscious down there. Now we take that over, activate it. In other words, we're in charge of it. Mm -hmm. We we take over that subconscious mind. And that is my definition on a book I wrote on hypnosis, which was published by the British Journal on Medical Hypnosis in London. So you were a psychologist as well, is that right? Uh, I did, uh, many people now, migraine headaches. What yeah. causes migraine headaches? Ah, good question. Yeah. Well, I can tell you what causes them. Go on. It's a conflict between the subconscious mind and the conscious mind. And they have a fight. And that fight brings on the me, your, your, your headache. Oh. And this is what causes it. But once I bring that forward under transgression, we transgress them back through the mind, to when this argument took place and take that away, migraines seem to finish. So, so can yeah. I just ask you one more question about the astral plane and you said you have a chat to people, you would have a chat to people and they were like they're in white sheets and stuff. Were they also people who were, who were astral travelling or what was, were they still... As far as I know, look. <laughs> so as far as you know, they were people who had been able to... I, I was lucky to be with old Rama Sharaka right. because he used to more or less, tell, we, we were just floating around saying good day to people and all this sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was just going to ask if you ever used any of the thought transfer, like the ability that you had when you were serving, like at, at wartime, like was it something that you weren't all that aware of at that time? Or? No, the only one thing there as far as that was concerned after I cleared that that village yet. Um, we come back and we were up in Darwin and we got a our CO got promoted to a brigadier, that was Doggerty, and uh, we got a chap by the name of Farrell. Well, I've heard of mongrel bloody officers before in my life and he even Beat even had his, his RSM put under arrest <laughs> or, or got a, one of the the officers we, uh, uh, the recruitment officer, he was uh, one of the recruits come up as an officer, Chaplain Owen Brown, it was his name. <laughs> and at any rate, uh, he come and got me one night and he said that there's some of, our, uh, some of the blokes are shooting up the, the camp. And I said, what are they doing? And he said, firing their guns off and cooking around and all that sort of thing. He said, well, you come down and set them down. I said, you're the orderly officer, you look after them. Hey, they won't do anything for me. So I went back and, and he said, put your revolver on. I said, I won't want that on. And I said, if they're our blokes, I said, I won't need a revolver. So I went down and here they are. They got half a bottle of sherry left. At the, they're knocking that off and yelling and hooraying and what have you. And I said, give us a go at that sherry. And I got the sherry down what was left and most was us. I said, come on, fag up. I've got to put you in the guard tent for the night and I said that there's a bunk there for you and we'll put it after that. And the next morning I, I was before the CO for by this orderly, this orderly officer, a recruitment orderly officer, uh, for drinking with the prisoners. <laughs> he couldn't put him in the guard tent and yet I put him in just by drinking out the sherry for him. And then he had, and uh, I said to the CO, I said, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm, I said, are you going to tear it up? And, Chuck it out, I said, it's ridiculous, too ridiculous for words. And uh, he said, I'm going to admonish you. I said, you're not, I'll go for a court martial. So I, 
I decided to go for a court martial, and and then the next thing I know, of course, I had to put out a project for the court martial, and uh, I said, "You'll need a am I under open arrest or close arrest?" And he said, "I said you'll need another W O one." And I said, "If you got me under close arrest, ah, oh, he says I suppose you're under open arrest." So, so at any rate, I uh, the next thing a runner come to me and he said the. Uh, Brigadier wants to see you immediately. I said, what's wrong with him? So I goes back over there and he's got my uh, my charge sheet that Farrell and this new CO we got, idiot, put out. And, I, he, and he said, what's, uh, what's all this about? And I told him what it was all about. And he ripped it up in front of me like that. And he said, I'm sending you down to the small arms school at Barangilla and uh, under this colonel and, uh, and he, uh, I said fair enough for well that was my ambition when I uh, was in the militia to be RSM of that small arms skill so I achieved what my ambition in life was and I wasn't there for more than a week and the CEO said what the hell are you doing here and I said Oh, I'm coming for the BR Assembly Small Arms School. He said, you may as well pack your bags now. He said, I'm sending you to opt your OCTU Officer Cadet Training Unit. So that's how, and I come out of that as a loot. And then I got uh, promoted then as uh, adjutant of a landing craft company. And I took the landing craft company up to Bougainville and uh, we did a uh, um, action up there, up at Buca Passage, north of Bougainville. That's where you got blown out of water, wasn't it? And I got blown up and and I swam out to sea and waited yeah. to be picked up. That's and I was talking Lewis. to this bloke and, <laughs> yeah. and Ted Lewis and yeah. he, he said, what did you do? I said, I was in hardware, Wythwaite's Arth in Wagga, what did you do? He said, I was in Grey Street. Walls End at uh, Truscott's at Walls End and uh, he said if we get out of this we'll go into business together. So that's how I was starting to build a house up at uh, Eckerburn in Brisbane and uh, I got this thing to come down. So I come down, stayed at this place when we went and had a look at this place and uh, we managed to get the, we didn't have enough money to buy it out. And then we, uh, uh, this chap's uh, uncle at a big dairy farm up out of Gloucester, Craven Creek, Creek mm. around the Craven Creek, and he had a big dairy farm up there. And he, had, he, he said he'd come down and have a look at the books, what bank are we with? Bank of New South Wales at Bullaroo. So he come down and looked over the the finances of this uh, shop that we were going into, and he said, I'll finance you in the shop. So that's how we got in the shop. His finances went in and uh, the bank which we paid off and which when I, when I bought the shop out I paid that off and took the shop over. So Anna was asking you, did you ever use your thought transference when you're in active service? No, no. You didn't use it at all? No, I didn't do that. No. If you had a choice, would you have stayed in the army or would you have gone to civilian life? Yes, I can tell you, tell you right, right about that. My idea was to stay in the army, yeah. but uh, then when we did this, I did in between that I did industrial psychology at Sydney Uni, but I just stayed in the army. That that suited me fine. Okay. But uh, I just trying to think what happened there. Marjorie said you've got to get out. <laughs> no. I'll, she, she wasn't happy about it. Yeah. Yes. At any rate, okay. to answer your question, yes, I just stayed in the army. I was more than happy about it. Sure. In, in fact, I finished up Deputy Assistant Quartermaster General was my uh, my staff okay. corps ranking. Right, okay. And uh, that was the Deputy Assistant Quartermaster General. That's my rank. Um, that was my uh, posting. Uh, for the Northern Territory. Oh, right, okay. So I'd, I'd have been going up to the Northern Territory to look after uh, the sale of the 
Army properties don't know all that sort of thing up there. That is the idea. So, is that a lieutenant's rank or a captain's rank? Well, you'd eventually be the, uh, I reckon, a, a major at least. Okay, yep. But I was still, I was still as a lieutenant. Right, okay. I had that rank as a lieutenant, although I had a posting as Deputy Assistant Quartermaster right. General. Okay. Did you get paid more for it? Oh, yeah, I, I, I think I did all right about that. Okay. And the second question I've got, um, because we're making this up for our audience of school kids, if you had one message okay, you would deliver to an audience of school kids, okay, what would you tell them? Now, this is a pretty good one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I reckon learn another, learn language. Uh, Make sure that you learn a second language. Okay. So, how old are you now? Do you want to know? 103, is that right? 102.6. 102.6. Don't forget the point six. 102.6. So 22nd of April, I was... Uh, 22nd of April is your birthday. Yeah. Right. Okay. 1970. Right, so you'll know by the time... So you'll be nearly 103 by the time we do the event next year, because the event is on the 7th of April. Yeah, well, I'm getting close. You'll be getting very close to 103. It'll be point eight by then. Yeah. <laughs> to try and uh, advise anyone to do anything and take on any profession, I'd tell them school teaching. Uh, you were with the 6th Division, weren't you? I was with the 2nd, 4th Australian Infantry yeah. Battalion, and uh, this, I run their uh, association yeah. for about uh, 15 years, I suppose. But was the 2nd, 4th part of the 6th Division? Oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah, they were the first deployed over to Yeah, we were a Syria. 16th Brigade. Yeah. 16th Brigade we were. Yeah. And then uh, in the Middle East they changed over there and were um, four battalions to a brigade. Yeah. And uh, that should have been the 4th, 8th and the 12th. Well the 4th and 8th went over and uh, the 11th because the 12th was in England. Yeah. So they took the number four battalion out of each brigade and they made the 19th brigade. So we go in the 19th brigade. And now on Anzac Day in Sydney, I'm the, uh, uh, the CO of the, uh, uh, the 16th brigade. Or the, uh, yeah, okay. second, uh, the, uh, what's the, what am I, I'm going to tell you in a second. So uh, you're in second Sydney. AIF. Yes. I'm, I'm, you're in Syria as well, so... Yes, we're up in Syria, a place called Jadidi. Yep. And that's up the head of the uh, West Bal 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 Valley. Yeah. And it's at the source Laronde. That's where the Laronde River starts. Yeah. And uh, it comes out of the side of the Albanian Alps, Albania and uh, Yugoslavia. Yeah. In the Alps there, that's where that... Where the river comes out of that. Right. Source Laurente River. And uh, where it comes out, there's a, quite a big dam there. And you can look into the water and say, oh, it's about a metre deep. And you go in, it's about five metres deep. The water's that clear. Yeah. Okay. And it's tremendous. And cold. I <laughs> swam in that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Source Laurente. We had a Christmas up there. And uh, we went up for the second uh, field regiment, their engineers. And uh, they'd uh, put nets across the river and uh, put on their uh, fish uh, Christmas dinner. And we went down and we're sitting around a bell tent, passing a bottle of scotch down and filling your pannikin up with the scotch. And, and the next one was a, a drop of water to put in and I knock it down. So it got Got asked me and I used a bottle of water and he, I put my hand back and I got what I thought was a bottle and, and and put it put it in mine. I didn't take any notice of it. And uh, anyway, when I went to have a taste of it, it was bloody kerosene. <laughs> <laughs> the next door to me was the driver we had taken us up, Ollie Blouse, and uh, 
he was taking it up and he put put whiskey in his. As soon as I smelled mine, I didn't, I didn't bother drinking it. I just had to taste it. And uh, Holly Blair's got this straight down there after he filled it up with 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 uh, with uh, kerosene. Uh oh. And then he had he was violently ill. I bet. And then he had we got him back to old Doc Long, Tom's and I, I drove him back and managed to get him back there after I cleaned myself out enough and, and took him into Doc and we told him what happened. So he put the stomach pump onto him and cleaned him out. And, oh, and wow. that, that poor old Ollie, he, he was pretty crook with it. Yeah. But that's not to say, they're the things that come, yeah. come to your mind as you yeah. go on. Yeah. Well, they're the, they're the good stories and they're... They're the stories that our students like to hear. Oh, yeah. you know, oh well, that's the main thing, yeah. too. Uh, I just wanted to know how many I killed. Uh, no, well, no, we not, don't. Not these guys. The guys you no. meet yeah. don't want no, to know well, more about well, that's okay. Yeah. No, I, it's I tell them it's different things about we want, that. We want the human interest yeah. stories. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, the but, story uh, about Ollie and those yeah. kind of guys. Yeah. Camaraderie. Yeah. yeah. I think moments of humanity as well, you know, like when you that you buried the Germans if you had time, like that shows an incredible level of humanity. Oh yes, well see, we were tied up with the uh, Pommy regiments too in those days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They weren't too bad. Yeah, we, 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 we're less focused on the actual story of the battles and more about the people inside. Yes, well I can tell them that. And different yeah. places where we won't see. Yeah, and that's and that and that's that's good for an overview. But, but you know, it's being telling us a, a specific event, you know, and the moment inside the event. That's what, that's what that's where the real interest comes.